been a tough week, though. We've had three deaths this week with Jimmy Lederman's brother and Carolyn Condon and Mike Lucas's grandfather only two weeks after his grandmother. There's a lot of difficulty. And then there are other people who are feeling the loss and emptiness of a loved one who has passed, maybe recently, maybe not so recently. And you just feel, many people feel that loss, even more especially during the holidays. That's why I asked Brother Taylor to read this passage from Psalm 103, because of the hope and the comfort that it gives us. And it paints a beautiful picture of God. It paints a beautiful picture of who God is, which really fits in to the theme that we have been talking about this year as far as the character of God, the personality of God, and who He is. And it's a very comforting passage, at least to me, and not just that thinking about when you're suffering grief and loss, but when you're thinking about sin and forgiveness, when you're thinking about eternity and salvation. It's a wonderful truth that I want us to think about for just a few minutes this morning. First, look at what the psalmist says in verse 14, talking about God. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. You know what? God made us. God made all of our ancestors, including our first two ancestors. And our oldest ancestor, he made from dust. And our second oldest ancestor, he made from the rib of the ancestor that he made from dust. He is mindful that we are but dust. Verse 15, he says, As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field. So he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it is no more. And its place acknowledges it no longer. It's an unhappy truth for a lot of people, but it's a truth that we all need to understand. Our lives are short. It was not intended to be this way from the beginning. He made us out of dust, but he gave us access to the tree of life, and that tree of life sustained us. And we have this groaning, we have this urge to live forever. But on this earth, we feel the pain of only lasting about the time that a flower in the field lasts. Look out at the fields and see how many flowers you see. You're not going to see many. You may see some red holly berries. That's about as close as you'll get because they've all died. The autumn winds blew, the frost came, and the flowers died. The leaves fell, and everything turned brown and gray. It happens every year. Death comes to us all. Unless the Lord comes back, it will come to those of us it has not yet come to. And God understands that point that he's making here, God knows that. God understands that. He understands that and he loves you anyway. But it should give you perspective on your life. It should give you some perspective on what's really important. What happens here or what happens after here. Another beautiful truth here is that God does not give us what we deserve. Look at verse 8. He says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. Brother Taylor used a different translation. I like the word that his translation used for a strive, but I've already forgot. But it was something like dispute with us forever, something of that nature. 
And that's the idea. The idea is not a competition where we're trying to win a race with God. The idea is where God is taking a tough tone, a corrective tone, where God is trying to punish and admonish an unruly person. He does that. He does correct. He does admonish. He does try to turn back to the right direction. But he doesn't do it forever. It's not constant. It's not the fundamental nature of our relationship with him. It's not the fundamental relationship, the, the fundamental nature of how he looks at us. He doesn't strive with us. He doesn't stay at odds with us forever. Not at all. Because he is abounding in loving kindness. He is gracious and compassionate. That when we hurt, when we feel grief, when we feel sorrow, when we feel regret, when we feel guilt, he understands. And he responds with grace and loving kindness. Look at what it says. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities in verse 10. That's not how God is. He is not a scorekeeper who is going to make the balancing of the scales fall on us. He is a God of justice. He is a God that requires ultimate payment for wrong. But he allows Christ to make our payment on our behalf. He allows the blood of Christ to balance the scales out for what we did wrong. It doesn't treat us the way we actually deserve. doesn't repay us according to the iniquities and the punishment that we have stored up for ourselves. Why not? He explains that in verse 11. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. Notice here that he's giving you another visual picture. He's painting you another picture of God's forgiveness, of God's loving kindness, his mercy. He says, as high as the heavens are above the earth. You think about that. You think about the distance. Well, driving down one of the mountains around here lately, it seems like the heavens may not necessarily be that far above the earth because you're in the clouds and sometimes you get all the way to the ground you're still in the clouds <coughs> to the valley. But that's not the heavens he's talking about. He's talking about the heavens of the moon and the stars. Think about it like this. God's loving kindness, God's gracious, loving disposition towards you stretches from here to far away galaxies. You can't comprehend the size of it. You can't comprehend the length of it. It's far beyond your ability to understand. In size. In depth. In greatness. He paints another picture in verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. It's another thing hard to picture. As far as the east is from the west. Think about the Orient. Think about Japan. If you picture it when you were in the fourth grade, if you were... In Miss Hemphill's fourth grade class in Petersburg Elementary, there was this big map over the wall. We didn't have a globe, we had a flat map. We probably had a globe too, I don't remember. I know we had a flat map. And all the way over there to the right was Japan. And it sort of, they tried to draw it where it bent around. And then all the way over here on the left was California. 
California was the West Coast, and Japan was the Far East. God says, as far as the East is from the West. Now, as far as the East is from the West, what? That's how far God has removed your sins. He's taken your sins from California and left them in Japan. As far as the East is from the West. Do you see? He's trying to paint you a picture of how forgiving and loving He is. Verse 13 does the same thing. He explains it in a more personal way. And just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. We can understand that. I want my children to do right. I want my children to grow up to be healthy, kind, generous, hardworking, trustworthy people. I do not want them to grow up under the ball and chain of punishment. I do not want them to grow up with the burden of feeling like they have to be perfect and never make a mistake. I want them to correct their mistakes. I want them to fulfill their potential. As a father has compassion <coughs> on his children. That's how God looks at us. That's how God looks at you. The way a loving dad looks at his beloved children. That's how you can understand God. And that's how you can have confidence. That's how you can put your faith in God's willingness <coughs> to forgive in God's willingness to save, in God's willingness to understand what you're going through. It's a beautiful picture. Isaiah 43, verse 25, says, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Sometimes we have trouble forgetting sins. If you make me mad enough, I may remember it for a long time. I have to confess that. I sometimes have trouble forgetting certain offenses. God doesn't. I don't want to tell you the sense in which God, who knows everything, forgets your sin, but I can tell you that it at least means this, that when he looks at you, he doesn't think about sin that he's forgiven. It's not to say that he can't go back into your history and remember and see what your sin is, but it's not the thing that comes up on the screen when he pulls up your file, which is all the time. God remembers your sin no more. He forgets it. He takes it off. He erases it. He wipes it out. It's not there anymore. It's no longer under consideration. Forgot. Praise God. Back to Psalm 103. These blessings of God are limited. Look at the end of verse 13. So the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. Look at verse 18. To those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them. This beautiful, peaceful, comforting picture of God here in Psalm 103 is only for the people who respect God. It's only for the people who acknowledge that God is our creator, he is our sovereign, he is our king, he is the one worthy of our worship and entitled to set the principles of our lives and our salvation and to treat him in any other way, to act like God does not have the authority to determine your destiny, 
that God does not have the authority to distinguish right from wrong and make that binding on you is to disrespect God. It's to act like God is nothing to be afraid of. It's to act like God's word doesn't really matter. It is to ignore and rebel against his word and his precepts. And it is to forfeit the blessings of a compassionate God full of grace and loving kindness. What a horrible mistake. And the truth is that a loving father would do the same thing. A child who consistently rebels and rejects the good things that the father provides for his children and exchanges them for evil things that hurts the father and the rest of his family, eventually that father will reach his breaking point and will cut that child off. And so will God. So will God. So the call is always there. To give God the respect that he deserves. To see him in his, in his true life. To understand his authority, his position. In addition to understanding his loving kindness and grace and forgiveness. They are interdependent. They all come as a package. But it's a comforting, peaceful package. I hope you'll take comfort in these words. I hope you'll remember that even though our lives in length are comparable to the flowers of the field, that when our lives here on earth end, our existence does not. But that we look forward to an afterlife, we look forward to a resurrection. And we can look forward to that resurrection with pleasure and anticipation if we are in Christ. If you do not enjoy the forgiveness that is available in Jesus, it's available freely to you today. Take advantage of the forgiveness that is available through his blood. To take advantage of that forgiveness, you must become a part of his body. You must become a part of Christ. To do that, you put your faith in Jesus. You believe who he is, you believe what he said, you believe what he did, to the point that you're willing to base your life on it, you're willing to stand up before people and confess your faith, you're willing to repent of your sins and to start living as God calls you to live, you're willing to submit in baptism, immersed in water for the forgiveness of sin. Galatians 3 says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, Put on Christ. Have clothed yourselves with Christ. It's in baptism that we contact the blood of Christ, that we put on Christ and become in Christ. If you want to put on Christ today, or if you need to return to Christ, please come down front as we stand and sing. <laughs>